I'm just letting everyone, everyone in. We'll start in one minute. Okay. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us to today's live session with our origin team titled Exploring Our Origins, Nicaragua. My name is Michelle Dunaway, and I am part of Novus Coffee Imports, and I will be your moderator today. Um, a few housekeeping things. Uh, please stay on mute during the presentation. Uh, feel free to type in your question in the chat box if you have any, any time. Um, the presentation should last about 30 minutes, and at the end, we will have time for more questions. So to celebrate National Coffee Day, we have a special giveaway. Uh, Novus Coffee will be giving away a 25-pound box of Nicaraguan coffee from Finca Buena Vista. Um, this is a female-owned farm. We will learn more about um, during our presentation. Um, you will be able to get this coffee either green or roasted, um, delivered directly to your door, uh, only to the, to the U.S., please. Um, so if you want to participate, uh, you just need to enter your name, please, in the chat box, and the winner will be announced um, on social media tomorrow. Joining us from Nicaragua, we have John Gardina. He is the sales director for the Americas for Mercon Coffee Group. Mercon Coffee is a global green coffee supplier uh, with the purpose of building a better coffee world and with vast experience in farming, production, trading, um, logistics, and risk management. Also joining us today, we have Scott McMartin. He is Director of Coffee at Novus Coffee Imports. He is joining us from Seattle, and he will be sharing with us cupping qualities that he has found sourcing coffee from Nicaragua. Novus Coffee is um, the specialty coffee armor of Marcon um, and offer a unique selection of high quality coffee grown with a focus on sustainability as well as a complete set uh, of services to support small roasters. Um, a little bit of background about uh, John and Scott. Um, so John has been with Mercon for over eight years and um, he spends his time promoting coffees from producing countries globally while supporting the rural communities that are essential contributors to providing this beverage to consumers around the globe. Scott has been in coffee for over 30 years and has vast experience uh, managing global coffee supply relationships, uh, leading quality teams, and also developing coffee blends. So Nicaragua, well Nicaragua is the largest country in Central America. It borders Honduras to the north and Costa Rica to the south. Um, it has a population of about 6 million and they're mostly concentrated in the western region of the country. Um, Nicaragua is a, spe a special origin to all of us. Morgan's history as a company began in Nicaragua in 1952. So a brief overview of history of coffee in Nicaragua. Um, coffee was first brought um, to Nicaragua in the years 1790, but it was not really until around 1840 that it gained economic importance. In the next hundred years, coffee plantations grew in the country and um, coffee gained uh, importance and it gained value. Um, sector um, in Nicaragua um, has been damaged uh, by a history of uh, political instability in the country um, and like many other producing 
countries, it has been damaged by historical crashes in coffee prices that at some point um, saw the collapse of three of the largest six banks in the country due to their level of exposure uh, to coffee production. All of this is history. Today, Nicaragua produces over 2 million bags of coffee and the future is looking bright. Um, so let's hear from John an overview of the current situation in Nicaragua, what the expectations are for 2021 crop, um, producer information, and also the programs that Morgan supports in coffee growing communities. Um, so without any delay, John, uh, please take it away. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. Good, good afternoon, good evening for the, those in Europe. And um, we're gonna give you a brief presentation on our on Nicaragua as a country and also on our operation and some of the sustainable programs that we have. So I hope you enjoy. Okay, so a little bit about um, Nicaragua growing regions. Basically, uh, we are estimating for the 2021 crop a total production of uh, a little bit over 2 million bags out of Nicaragua. This is about a 5% reduction versus last year. And the total number of producers in Nicaragua is uh, very near 40,000, most of them being very small producers. There are 100 and close to 150,000 hectares of coffee in Nicaragua. However, the average yield, as you can see, is very low. It's about 13 bags per hectare. This number is debatable, but in, in our opinion as a company, we, we consider that, that this is the national average. Um, the harvest, uh, the coffee harvest in Nicaragua occurs between October and March. For example, we have already actually started, we're only in September, we have already started opening some purchasing centers. We're receiving very small amounts of coffee for the moment, but, but the peak usually will be, let's say, no, uh, November to January, I would say, and, and having the, the majority of the coffee coming out during the month of December. Uh, the average altitude of the coffee plantations in Nicaragua range between 900 and 1500 meters above sea level. Uh, most of the fermentation, most of the wet milling done in Nicaragua uh, is done as natural fermentation process done in farms. So Nicaragua is not like many other origins that have centralized wet milling stations. Actually, uh, even though the majority of the producers in Nicaragua are very small, maybe a few hectares of land, they do their own fermentation on their own farm for the most part. And they usually uh, sell their coffee wet or, or in a wet parchment to the exporter who is who is in charge of drying the coffee. Um, most of the drying in Nicaragua is sun is done uh, naturally sun dried and is mostly done in the Sebaco Valley uh, which is uh, very close to Matagalpa. Uh, the main shipment periods of for coffee uh, in Nicaragua range between December and July Usually, uh, May is usually the highest shipment month for the year. Um, in Nicaragua, we have Arabica coffee. The different varieties that you can find in the country are Caturra, Borbon, Pacamara, Maragogipe, Maracaturra, Catuai, Catimor, among others. And then and we also, as a company, brought uh, Conilons to Nicaragua, which is, let's say, a variety of, of, uh, of Robusta coffee, uh, that's planted in Brazil, and we planted it in, on the eastern region of the country, which is um, it, it, it's basically mostly pasture lands that we have almost created a new economy, bringing a new um, a new variety of coffee to this region and giving producers an alternative source of income. And as for the production of the country, where where it comes out of, I would say seventy percent of the production of the of the production of Nicaragua comes from Hinotega and Matagalpa region. That's the, the majority. I would say about 10 to 15% comes out of Nueva Segovia, which is also bordering Honduras. And 10% will come out of the Pacific region, which is very close to Managua between the two lakes. And then 5% will be Robusta, which will be on the, on the southeastern coast of, uh, of Nicaragua. 
please feel free. Uh, I don't mind making this intera interactive. So if you guys have questions during the presentation, I have absolutely no problem in you raising your hand or writing something in the chat. To give you a little more information about the landscape of the producers in Nicaragua, uh, as I mentioned, most of the producers are small. Uh, we consider small producers smaller than 14 hectares. There you go, yeah. Smaller than 14 hectares, mid-sized producers between 14 and 35 and large producers above 35 hectares. So as you can see, over 90% of the producers of the country are, are small holder producers. However, when you look at their average yield, their average yield is only 9.5 bags per hectare. And when you look at the large producers, there's, there's much less amount in, in volume. However, they have a lot of, of, of land area and their production uh, their production yield is usually a lot higher. However, this does not mean that there's not large producers that have lower yields and small producers that have higher yields. But this is basically the landscape of how uh, the typical producers in Nicaragua are distributed. We can go on to the next slide. So this is, uh, this is basically the Nicaragua production where it has been between a 15, 16 crop to 2021 crop. So as you can see, it's been fairly stable, even though we have seen very low prices in the, in the previous, I'd say three to four years. Uh, and yes, production has come down from a, a record year in 1819 of 2.6 million bags down to what we consider uh, will be a, a crop estimate of about 2 million bags. However, it could be a little higher. It's still a little bit too early to say. Um, this 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 decrease in production, I think it's obvious uh, that the, the co current coffee prices are affecting it at the moment. However, I, I think that the producers are being resilient, and if we do see and when we do see higher prices, we we should see a rebound pretty quickly on the production to levels of 18, 19, and even higher. We can move on to the next slide. So a little bit about our, our operation in, uh, in Nicaragua. Uh, our, our operation in Nicaragua is called CISA Exportadora. Uh, we are the largest exporter in the country. Um, it's part of the Mercon Coffee Group. Uh, we, we work directly with over 6,000 producers to which we purchase from. We, we usually tend to have between 35 to 40% market share of the total production of the country is what we export. And most of the coffee that we buy is bought directly from the producers. So we, we work with direct relationships. Uh, over 3,000 producers uh, that we work with are certified. This, uh, when I say certified, I mean Oots, Rainforest, Cafe Practices, Triple and Espresso, uh, Lyft, which I'm going to talk about later, or any other certificate that adds value to their coffee. Um, and the, the company was founded in, in, uh, in 1952, 68 years ago. This was actually the first company of the group. Uh, after this, uh, let's say Mercon sprouted from CISA, but CISA was really the, the pioneer for the group. So we are very well invested and very well um, uh, uh, motivated to keep on working in this country and supporting it. Um, our strategy in Nicaragua is to get as close as we can to the producer and to offer end-to-end -end services. So we, one of our uh, biggest strengths is our purchasing network. And we, we try to open purchasing stations up in the mountains, very close to the producers, and make sure that they have easy access to be able to deliver their coffee and receive payment immediately if they need it. So we, we open usually, depending on the year, but I'd say close to 150 purchasing stations throughout all the coffee producing regions. We also, uh, we have the largest um, uh, nursery in Nicaragua, that, so we also provide plant leaves to the producer if he wants to, to plant uh, or he wants to renew areas or add new areas to his farm. We provide financing services, so we have a financing arm that makes sure that they have access to credit. Uh, not only access to credit, but it's access to credit at lower levels than the regular banking system in, in the country. Uh, which has been has gone through a lot of problems since the 2018 political crisis that we had. 
not only that, but many of the producers are very small hold producers that in some cases don't have land titles and they don't even have access to credit. So this gives them their only access to credit might be through a microfinancing arm that would charge them very, very high rates, but they are able to receive rates that are very competitive that any producer that does have land titles or does have collateral could get from a large bank. Um, we also provide technical assistance our technical, our te technical agronomist team has grown quite substantially in the past few years. In Nicaragua, if I'm not mistaken, we have between 40 and 50 agronomists at the moment. And we, we also let producers fix their coffee prior to the harvest or after the harvest. So what, what this means is that, for example, if, if we're, for example, today, you're a producer, you haven't handed the, you haven't delivered the coffee to us but the coffee market is, a, is at a price where you feel comfortable that you could sell your coffee at. You can come to us, fix the price at that certain moment, even though we haven't received the coffee and deliver the coffee at a later date. Another option is, for example, come December, you're ready to deliver the coffee to us, but you go to our purchasing station and our prices seem low because right now the, the C market is very low. So you say, you know what, I, I, I'd rather deliver my coffee to you but I don't want to fix the price today. I want to fix the price later. So you can deliver the coffee and wait for a better price. And if it happens, you can fix later on. And you can also get a, a, a partial payment toward, uh, uh, towards the amount of coffee that you deliver. So we try to be as flexible as we can with the producers and make it as easy for them in order to, to be able to benefit the most. Um, I think that's that's one of uh, our biggest differentiators from the competition in the country. Um, I think we can move on. I think, uh, Scott, I'll pass the mic to you so you can discuss a little bit more about the qualities. Oh, wait, sorry. Before that, just wanted to show you. So on the top left, you can see uh, the, our, the Arabica mill that we have. This, this mill is called uh, San Carlos. It's, it's in Matagalpa. It's the largest coffee mill in Nicaragua. Um, then on the top right, you can see, like I said, over 90% of the coffee that is produced in Nicaragua is sun-dried. So you can, this is a aerial picture of some of the patios where we dry coffee. During the peak of the harvest, we have 100 hectares of coffee uh, drying at one uh, specific time. So, I mean, it's, it, you can't really appreciate it in that picture, but it, it's really amazing to see during the harvest. And then in the bottom, you can see some of our drying tunnels, which we use to, to dry some of our specialty lots, which uh, Scott will be talking about next. Thanks, Johnny. Hi, I'm Scott McMartin. Really nice to see everybody. Um, thanks, Michelle, for setting this up and bringing everybody together. Uh, greetings from Seattle. I wanted to talk a little, a little bit about some of the great coffees that we've seen this year. But um, one, one small note: it's, uh, it's, it's great to be here uh, with Mercon and with Novus uh, talking about Nicaragua. Nicaragua is actually the, the first country as a coffee buyer that I ever bought coffee from um, over 25 years ago. And uh, visiting Sisa was uh, one of my first origin trips, actually, and. Um, I worked for a large, uh, a large coffee roaster here in the Northwest, and we uh, were experimenting back in those days with um, Nicaraguan coffee, specifically coffees that were produced um, and exported by CISA. So it's great to come full circle all these years later and be, uh, be involved so closely with Origin and promoting some of the amazing coffees that are grown in Nicaragua. Um, the first one that, that uh, we're quite fond of is um, from Finca Esmeralda, and Another Hinotega coffee, high altitude, uh, uh, that we've had great success with. This is a, a special project that began a, a number of years ago. And Johnny can let me know how many years ago we, we started um, the Red Cherry Project. But it's been three years, uh, ago. Three years ago. Okay, so it's been a, a very deliberate, special, small group of producers, almost a, uh, a collective group, not a cooperative group, who have focused specifically on, on picking the ripest, most perfect red cherry, using things like raised drying beds and doing an amazing job of sorting and collecting the coffee. So at, at Novus, we've, uh, we've purchased 
a, a good majority of this coffee each year and some of the experimentation and, and the, the work done to bring quality out here has been amazing. We've seen some naturals, um, regular wash coffees and the quality has been, been exceptional. So it's a small, you know, it's a small amount of coffee produced each year, but we think it's something that uh, will continue to grow and, and may even have potential to grow into different origins. So we're, we're very, very keen on, on the Red Cherry project. Uh, in the cup, uh, really uh, amazing body, a lot of uh, floral notes, and um, you know a little bit more, I would say, more depth and more layered than your your typical in quotes Nicaraguan coffee. We found this to have notes of chocolate and um, not just be a straightforward acid coffee, but have a lot of complexity. So uh, a favorite in our tasting room for sure. Uh, the next coffee we're going to talk about is. Uh, our one coffee that we that we at Novus are, are referring to as uh, our Type A, which uh, matches some personalities of our team here. Uh, um, sorry, just talking about myself there. Um, this particular coffee was a blend we developed in partnership uh, with our cupping team and with our team at Tisa, and the idea was to develop something that was consistently very bright, juicy, and and acidy. So this this went back. Um, many iterations of, of looking at different cup profiles, looking at different different producer groups to come up with a blend that we thought had had this very, very juicy, acidy uh, character. And in some cases, you know, we're cupping these coffees and they cup like the, some of the finest coffees grown in Costa Rica or even better. So really bright, really juicy. And for our customers uh, at Novus, we've had great response to this coffee as a, as a blend component. And, and some people are offering it as well as a single origin just because of how crisp and bright uh, the acid is. So we're, we're super excited on this one. This is a category we anticipate continuing to grow um, for us here in, in the Novus book. And that I should mention too, that coffee also is part of a, a, a lift cluster, which is uh, a program that we have at Mercom that is coming up on year six and specifically working with a team of agronomers and producers to come up with continuous improvement initiative to increase yield, increase productivity on the farm level, increase farm practicing, farm practices and uh, farm management practices. So it's a program that we're, we're very excited about and continues to grow each year within our portfolio of coffees. The next coffee. I'm sorry, was there a question? Um, no, I think it's uh, just some background noise. Um, we can continue. Okay. So, Thicca Cabo Azul. Um, Johnny, maybe you should talk about the, the history of this coffee. You're more familiar with it. I can talk about the cup, but. Um, it's a coffee that's been in the portfolio for, for CISA and for Mercon for, for some years. I don't know the, the exact history. Maybe you can fill in the blanks there for me. Yeah, we, we've been working with this farm for 20 years, basically. It's been a, for a long time. Um, we always realized that it had a, a superior cup profile than most of the other estates that we work with. Uh, so it's really been one that it, it's, it's actually been really easy to promote because the demand for it has been very stable. People uh, are really... Um, interested in the cup profile that it offers, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about the cup profile. Sure, in the cup, we're, we're finding this one um, to have a lot of, uh, exotic is the wrong word, but to have things like stone fruit notes, like apricots and um, a very good balance and also have some floral characters. So if I think about the, you know, the contrast of something like the type A that I just spoke of, uh, some of these, these estate coffees, there's another one coming up here, um, they're just the next layer of complexity. They have a little bit more going on, not just in terms of body, but the, if I had to pick like, what's the one, what's the one word that differentiates some of these coffees is they're a little bit more floral and, you know, there's also a degree of complexity that we're finding that, that help them stand on their own as good single origin offerings. Uh, next coffee. You should be think of Buena Vista. Um, this is a special coffee as well. A very uh, interesting lift coffee as well. Part of the Red Cherry Project, this is a female-owned farm that we are selling as a, uh, 
female producer differentiated coffee within our Novus portfolio. And the cup on this one is, um, this might sound strange, but it's really, it has a, a peach flavor almost. It's really bright and acidy, but also a lot of really nice fruit notes um, that's been very special. So again, another example of the Red Cherry Project coffee. And this one we differentiated because it was the micro lot and we thought it was so special. And the other estate uh, that we're, we're quite keen on is uh, is Monimbo. And this is another historic estate for, for CISA and for Mercon, um, owned by the Marinko family. And we've, we've been involved with this coffee for a long time. It's a historic farm. Um, there is also a, uh, a school attached to the farm that we've been supporting, um, which is makes it kind of extra special for all of us. And then flavor profile wise, uh, this one again has has some of those great citrus notes, but more along the lines of uh, of grapefruit and um, a lot of florals and a really big complex note. So we've seen a lot of both with Cabo Azul and with Monimbo, these coffees have have gone beyond sort of the the blender status and are standing on their own as really fine examples of single origin Nicaraguan coffee of of very high altitude and very careful preparation and cultivation. Um, if you don't mind me, uh, we, uh, me interrupting Scott, we have a question from Edward. Um, he's asking what is, and maybe uh, either John or Scott can answer this, uh, what's the availability of each of those, uh, the lift cluster specialty coffees um, on a yearly basis? Um, Specialty coffee out of the lift clusters, or are you talking about just in general how much coffee we buy from lift clusters? Um, I think he means um, out of the lift clusters, yes. Uh, I w out of the total lift clusters, if I'm not mistaken, it's over 250,000 bags in Nicaragua. So it's almost a third of the coffee that we're buying is, um, is coming from lift, lift clusters. And this is because now about half of our producers are now under the lift program. So. Okay. And our goal is to get him all onto the lift program. Okay, and he has a one more question. He's asking if any of those are organic certified coffees. We are working at the moment on two organic clusters, one for Robusta and one for Arabica. Um, so as of today, no, but we are, uh, we might be able to start offering for 21, 22 grams. Okay. Thank uh, sorry, you, 20, 2021 crop. Sorry, next okay. this, this coming crop. So, is, was that you, Edward? Edward? Yes. Okay, uh, I'll get in touch with him. I can I can send him more information. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Excellent. Is that all the copies? I think so. That's all the ones we wanted to highlight today, right? Thank now on to a little bit about lift. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I see one more question as well. Yes. Go ahead. Um, it's from Maria, and she says, "How can I become part of lift?" Is Maria a producer in Nicaragua? Maria, if you would type in the chat box or get off mute. Yes, I am. I am. I am. Okay, we have uh, at the end of my presentation, there'll be my email. So if you can send me an email, I'll be more than happy to put you in contact with our purchasing department. And um, my Okay, then I can explain you more. It's not interested for interesting for everyone, but yes. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank so you. I'll put everyone's email in the chat box at the end of the Zoom meeting so you guys have it. Perfect. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. So a little bit about our LIFT program. Scott mentioned it already, but this has been a, a major success. And for us, uh, sustainability is part of our DNA. And um, it, this program basically is a continuous improvement program where we are basically training producers. It's a three-year training program where we're teaching producers best farm practices um, in order to increase productivity in an environmentally and social conscious way. Um, what we do is we usually do February to September or March to October, but it's basically eight uh, sessions, one per month, off harvest. So obviously during the harvest, producers are very busy, but when they're off harvest, once a month, we get them together and we provide them training. And many of the trainings are done on site 
so they can uh, visit each other's farms and see what, what, what other producers are doing in the region and learning from each other as well. Uh, we currently have this, um, this program implemented in all of our origins, so Nicaragua, Arabica and Robusta, Honduras, Brazil, Vietnam. And uh, we're opening our Ethiopia operation at the moment and uh, uh, Lyft is also gonna be a, a, a very important part of this operation as well. 100% uh, of the Lyft producers that we work with um, have some, some type of certification. So this goes way beyond certifications. I have nothing against Oots, Rainforest Cafe practices. All those certificates, they're all great. They all looked, they all tried to improve the well-being of producers. However, this goes way beyond that. And uh, it, it, it also, uh, we also work with producers on a farm specific plan. So each farm has their own necessities and we treat each farm as an individual and we make up each plan based on each producer's needs. So this, this has uh, proven to be a, a successful way of increasing their productivity. and improving the livelihood, but we can, can you guys see the next slide? I'm on the, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. I'm we in Nicaragua. Yeah, we lost you for a second, oh, you're back. Sorry about that. All right, so the three pillars, uh, three pillars of our program are basically productivity, social development and environment. So obviously you saw in the first slides that productivity is one of the biggest problems that we are, one of the biggest issues that we're facing. We have very low productivity. However, we have pr uh, producers in the country that are producing twice as much or even three times as much as, as the lowest producing uh, in the country. So there's opportunities of improvement and that's what we're focused. That's one of our major focuses. Uh, the other one is there's ways of increasing productivity, but it's also important to be very cautious about the environment. I mean, especially now with all the demands of the industry and everything we know that's going on in in the world, it's very important that we protect basically the, the, the biodiversity of each country that we live in. And especially with coffee, you know how much water usage it goes into it and how much contamination used to go into and still does in some cases into, into water sources. So it's very important for us to tackle this. And then finally, we have the uh, social practices, which basically include uh, child labor, which is a big issue in, uh, in the coffee industry, as well as uh, minimum wages, uh, protective equipment for all employees. Uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, the training sessions in the next slides. Okay, so this gives you a, a little idea of how the curriculum works. So basically, like I said, it's a three-year program. Every year you see uh, different topics on each one of the pillars. Uh, for social development, we see the same topics every year because they're the most critical ones. But usually what we try to do is the first year we focus on understanding their farms and what can we do to increase our productivity. And then the second and third year are more maintenance and, and how to improve on things that maybe weren't done right the first year. But, but they get a, a very um, elaborate training course on how to manage their farms. And the improvements that we have been able to see have been very substantial. And we'll show you a little bit more on the, on the next few slides. So at the moment, uh, we have 3,000 producers under the program, under uh, over 70 agronomists uh, working with each one of these producers. We have been able to, uh, we have been able to um, to provide 2,000 training events. At each training event, you can have between 10 and 20 producers, so that gives you the amount of producers that have attended. Uh, 600,000 bags of coffee. This is this is uh, this slide is showing us as a uh, as a as a company, not only Nicaragua. That's why you see more volume than I said. And, and then also we have been working with 35,000 hectares of, of coffee. This is in all our five origins. Uh, John, can I interrupt you for a second? I have a question. 
And I think it ties with uh, the previous slide. Um, this is Matt and he's asking, what are the barriers to higher productivity? Um, is this by choice for higher quality or um, is it a result of disease, uh, climate, labor, or any, any other factor? What is, uh, what is the, the barrier to higher productivity? I, I mean, I think all of the above would be the answer, but it depends on each case, but there's many, there's many things that affect productivity. One of it, it could be basically the management of the farm. You're, you're basically, you're, you might not be providing enough nutrients to the plants that they need in order to produce more. You might, you might not be renovating your farms, but in other cases, you might be doing everything right, but uh, we see climate change has affected, has affected many areas as well. So, there's not, I, I don't think there's one specific answer. And I, I know there's probably some producers in the audience as well, and maybe they could also communicate their opinions. But in my opinion, mm -hmm. it, it, it varies a lot depending on each circumstance. Okay, thank you, John. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this gives you an idea of in Nicaragua, what we have seen from the NIST program. So as I mentioned, the national average of production in Nicaragua is, um, the, the, is, is 13 bags per hectare. <clears throat> Our non-lift producers, so producers that work with us that are not necessarily uh, under our lift program, produce a bit higher than the average of the country, 16.3 bags per hectare, which is a 25% increase versus the, the basically the, the average of the country. Now our lift producers are already producing 24.1 bags per hectare, which is basically 48% above our non-lift producers and above 80% above the national average. So I think this, this has been six years of data and we have been able to prove that um, the, the program is working and, and very substantially. I mean, the data is very evident. Okay, um, John, I have another question. Yes. Um, Maria Alejandra is um, asking, uh, which areas of Nicaragua do you think have been most affected by climate change? Um, she mentions that her farm is in, um, and correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but it's in Nikinomo. Nikinomo, yes. Okay. Um, Honestly, I might not be the best person to answer this because I'm sure there's many areas of the country that have been affected, but I know I can tell you for a fact that the Pacific region of the country has definitely been affected where coffee actually started in Nicaragua. Uh, this area it does not have the same amount of water as it used to have. Um, but I've also heard that also in the Northern region, close to Ocotal, uh, the, there's also many other areas that have, that have been impacted, impacted as well. One of the major reasons there, from what I hear, has been a lot of deforestation. Um, but if there's, like I said, if there's anybody else here that wants to add and, and with their personal experience, uh, please share. Okay. But I would say those two regions. Thank you, John. Okay. Um, so now I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about our Seeds for Progress Foundation. So. Part of our strategy is not only to, to, um, uh, to speak to the producers, but also to try to improve the communities in which coffee comes from. One of the biggest problems in Nicaragua that, that we face is, is education. Unfortunately, the budget, the government budget for education in Nicaragua is extremely low. The conditions that, um, that students have to, have to go to school and in Nicaragua in, in general in, public, in the public school system are, are less than desirable. So we have uh, for over a decade, almost two decades, we have decided to invest a lot in education. And that's, that's when we created the Seeds for Progress Foundation. Uh, can you move on to the next slide, please? So basically uh, in Nicaragua, we, we have uh, our Seeds for Progress Foundation is is basically managing 24 of the schools, which affect 400 and uh, almost 5,000 students and 272 teachers. So what the what the foundation does is 
many different types of projects. Many of the projects that we do are, are infrastructure. I mean, some of these schools don't have access to water or don't have access to, to, to a, a floor or, or equipment. And once we're able to invest in the infrastructure, we, we start investing in, first of all, the teachers, teaching teachers, because in the end, it's a multiplier effect. The more teachers you train, the more students that are gonna be uh, trained as well uh, and taught as well. And we also invest in, um, in um, technology. So as you can imagine in many of these schools, uh, there's barely, or in some cases, barely even electricity, but uh, we have even, uh, taken internet to many of these schools, we've taken computers, um, and given, given uh, students more motivation to go to these schools, when you're learning with te technological uh, tools, it motivates you a little bit more to go to school than going to a school that, that doesn't have uh, very many resources. So it, it has proven to be a very successful program, and, and it, 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 the donations that go into this foundation come from, from a whole wide range of, uh, of people in the supply chain. So even producers support it. In many cases, producers actually donate land where we build schools on, so they're very involved in it as well. Uh, our own employees, Mercon employees and, and the sister companies of, of the Mercon group uh, donate quite a substantial amount of money into this foundation as well. Uh, banks, roasters, uh, roaster partners are extremely important, individual donators, insurance companies, but basically we're trying to, even um, uh, logistical companies. So we're trying to get the whole supply chain involved in, uh, in these donations because in the end, uh, I mean, we all depend on, on this industry at the moment and if communities aren't prospering, then it's gonna be very difficult for, for, for this to continue. So, so thank you. Uh, that everybody everybody's here that's that's helped donate to this to this cause in in guatemala we have uh we just started the foundation we just opened it basically last year uh, at the moment we're, we we're only working four schools in palencia and jalapa uh, which uh, which house 180 students and five teachers um, our strategy is gonna to be to implement the same thing that we, that we have done in Nicaragua, in Guatemala, and hopefully all of our other origins as well. And then just some highlights uh, from the program. At, at the moment, we have 28 schools under management, 5,000 uh, students uh, are, are benefiting from this program, and 500 teachers, 3,800 families, uh, most of them uh, come work or have something to do with the coffee industry. And they're spread around 144 communities uh, in Nicaragua and, and Guatemala at the moment. So these are some of the short-term impacts. I talked a lot, a lot about these already, but obviously better schooling conditions are key. And uh, you have uh, prepared and empowered teachers. This is very important. Better academic student performance because they're more motivated to go to a school that has the conditions that they need. Parents, um, uh, they value education more and make sure that their students are going to school. Uh, communities have access to quality education and, and students are motivated to attend school. So between uh, our LIFT program and our Seeds for Progress program, we're almost creating a circle of prosperity in these coffee communities and making sure that um, future generations are actually motivated to come back and work in the industry. Um, okay, I think there's a question. I don't know if you want me to. Um, let me see. Yes, uh, you can. You can read it if you want. Um, Mercon is from which country? Mercon is from Nicaragua. Uh, how is the company structured? Um, I, I no, can't. Yeah, Pardon? I don't want to. I don't want to ask you things which are not relevant. So the questions are there, but you don't have to answer them now. Maybe at the end. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Yes, I, I think that because we are, are running um, out of time, we can um, just uh, follow up with everybody that has uh, questions that are, that are still unanswered on the chat box. Um, and we can uh, follow up with an email or a conversation. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, I just, I think it's important we, um, 
we talk about COVID-19 and our concerns and uh, what we're planning on doing because it's something we're all living through right now. Yes. Uh, so basically our major concern uh, for the moment is that we're gonna have a, a, a peak in the curve of cases during the harvest. Uh, this obviously is gonna be uh, a difficult uh, problem to handle, especially mobilizing pickers throughout the country. Another big pro, uh, problem that we see is it will be in the, in the camps where pickers stay on the farms. Many of these do not have the conditions to prevent COVID spread. Uh, if measures are not taken, this can become a serious problem. And regarding borders being closed, uh, which is not the case right now, but it's almost, the, the Nicaraguan uh, government has been very complicated letting people in and out of the country. But this actually is not gonna cause a problem for pickers in the country because most of our pickers migrate to other countries. So we're actually probably gonna have excess pickers in Nicaragua uh, for this harvest. Um, right now our biggest challenge is basically educating producers uh, and not only producers, but also uh, workers on the farms and in the communities to make sure that they implement these controls and take measures to mitigate, uh, to mitigate the risk. So I just wanted to show you a little bit about what we're doing as a company in the next slide. So uh, we, we printed material to educate producers on COVID. Uh, this is with the support of FMO, which is a development bank. Uh, and we also have sent educational material through WhatsApp in a, in, in, um, to all of, our, all of our producers in the country. Uh, we, we are providing education coloring books to all of our schools through our Seeds for Progress foundations. We're providing PPE equipments to producers as well. Uh, the Export Association in Nicaragua is also uh, coming out with radio and uh, different uh, communication channel announcements in order to make more awareness. Um, agronomists, our agronomists are training on how to educate producers on COVID as well. So we're training our agronomists on how they need to train producers. Um, we raised over $120,000 from roasters and from employees to buy PPE equipment, and we distributed them to 84 medical centers in coffee communities throughout the country. And then we also uh, raised over $2 million in premiums for producers, which we will be um, giving out actually in the next few weeks. Um, and at our, at our mill, it's very, I mean, we have a 24 hour clinic we're providing transportation to our employees so that they're not using, using public transportation. We have many sanita sanitation areas. We're, we're taking as many measures as possible, but as you know, this is still an extremely difficult situation and um, we're hoping for the best, but planning for the worst. Mm -hmm. and, and then I think in the next slide, maybe you can just see a, a few, few pictures of, of some of the mm -hmm some of the materials that we have handed out to our producers. But that's, that's pretty much it on my side. Um, just wanted to thank all of you that buy Nicaragua coffee. <laughs> uh, thank you for supporting the country. And for those of you that maybe don't buy Nicaragua yet, I hope this presentation at least made you a little bit more curious about our coffees. Thank you, John, um, for, for, for your thoughts. Um, to close up, um, I would like to ask uh, both of you, um, Scott and John, um, a question. Um, what, and, and, and this is, um, it can be answer, um, like your personal opinion, if you will. Uh, what do you guys think that um, sets this origin, sets Nicaragua aside uh, from other origins? You want to take that, Scott, or should I take? Yeah, it? I'll, I guess we both answer. Maybe I'll, I'll start. Um, for, for me, I think um, I've seen a tremendous improvement in in quality over the years, um, mm -hmm. and refinement of of uh, varieties, leading to to really better cup quality. So I'm excited about this, about Nicaragua, and about the coffees from this origin because it's, uh, as I mentioned, going through some of those coffees, we have great coffees that can add. Mm -hmm. A level of acidity and complexity to a blend and we also have very nice coffees that can stand on their own as a single origin offering uh, as part of a, a state coffees so i think there's a lot of, of really really exciting coffees coming out of the country and 
a, a great advantage is, is these coffees are, are typically priced at a value compared to other origins mm -hmm. for how good the quality is. And that's, that's for us really one of the great selling points. We can get a cup quality out of Nicaragua that is, is better than uh, some uh -huh. of the neighboring countries at a, at a better price. Thank yeah, you. I, I completely agree with all of Scott's comments. I would, I would add to that. <laughs> um, also, when you buy Nicaragua, Nicaragua is very consistent and reliable. I mean, it's such a reliable origin. You know that you're going to get the coffee on time. You know what the coffee that you're going to get is, uh, you know what you can expect. But uh, as well, I think the, the, one of the biggest benefits, I think, of Nicaragua is the quality versus price that you're getting is really, it's, it's almost like a bargain, I feel. And I, 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 I personally think yeah. Nicaragua coffee should be more expensive, to be honest. Well, thank you to both of you. Um, and thank you to everyone that uh, joined us today. Uh, John and Scott's email is on the screen right now. If you have any question that we didn't cover today, we didn't have time to, to, to get to that, um, you can email us. Uh, mine is on the screen as well. Um, we'll be happy to continue the conversation, especially with Maria Alejandra, that she, uh, she wants to be part of, of Lyft and learn more about it. Um, um, I, I've been waiting actually for four months to hear from Lyft and that's why I, and now I'm not in Nicaragua, I'm in the Netherlands and I saw that Merco, a company in the Netherlands, that's why I asked because I don't know much. Mm -hmm. I inherited the farm from my uh, mother because it was completely, she lives in Europe as well, she's married to my father and I started it all a year ago and I need a lot of help. <laughs> That is, that is great, and and, and um, yeah, we are. I think we're here for that, and um, I'm sure that John can um, take that and, and connect you to the right people in Nicaragua. Yes, please send me an email, Maria Alejandra. I'll be I'll be more than happy to help you. Okay, or can you or can we do it like uh, our email is so? Can we do it over WhatsApp one of these days? Sure, no no problem. Do you okay. want to write down my number, or should I write down yours? You can. Yeah, you can put your, your number in the in the chat box, uh, Maria Alejandra, and, and we'll give you a call. I think that'll be easier. Fabulous. I'll okay. give you my WhatsApp number, not my Nicaragua number. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, I hope you all have enjoyed this session, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.